Good morning. Good morning. It's Maria Quattrone here at Remax at Home, uh, actually in my office today. And be the solution with my guest, John David W. Franklin. Good morning, John. Good morning, Maria. John is a longtime uh, friend that i am my sister, actually, Lisa, and I've known for quite some time now. I don't know how many years it's been, John. A long time. A long time. <laughs> it's, a long time. it's been a while. But John is the senior vice president of Madison Marquette. Um, he's been in Philadelphia and, and part of the real estate community in matters of in transactions nationally and internationally. He's... Um, part of ICSC, which is the International Council of Shopping Centers. We could talk about that great event that you everybody missed in May, right? Absolutely. And uh, he's been awarded the Distinguished Trustees Award um, this year for his contribution to the global shopping center industry. So that's, that's big time. We're gonna talk about what's happening in the whole world today. Um, not only is John an educator and a sportsman, but his family is very, very important to him. His wife and his sons, Zachary and Samuel, um, are active members of the Philadelphia community as well. Alexis, um, I love your wife. She is a very, very awesome and sweet woman. She's an actress and notable environmentalist as she chairs the Friends of McMichael Park. And Zachary does international finance and Samuel practices real estate law at Eckerd Seaman. So John, welcome today. I'm excited to speak with you. Uh, and on what's going on in our world, especially uh, in the real estate in sector. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing? Thank you, Maria. Good morning. And uh, yes, indeed, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, the family has uh, endured 109 days of uh, self-quarantine. Uh, you mentioned Alexis and uh, the last two shows she worked on were uh, both Philly shows, Dispatches from Elsewhere and uh, Night Shyamalan Servants. So if you're uh, binge watching Servants, you can jump to episode 10. And, Epi uh, oh, episode she's 10. in episode 10. But, yeah, and um, Zach has been here in the United States with us, uh, obviously handling his international clients from uh, Philadelphia, as has most of the uh, finance community uh, who has been self-quarantined. And as you say, Sam's at Eckert doing real estate law, and we'll certainly talk more about uh, the trajectory of transactions we've seen either, you know, through the quarantine and now that we're hopefully getting out of that. But, uh, you know, like yourself, most of us in the real estate world have been dealing with, uh, you know, a, a number of factors, which I think at this point, historically are almost commonsensical. And to recite that history is important nevertheless, because um, I like to use two quotes, which I, you know, uh, took uh, from the last few weeks, uh, other experts from other industries who have now had a chance likewise to see that. You know, a number of people say that on February 4th, we were warned. So here we are, you know, 14 weeks into this, and we've had a lot of time to think about that, either in anger or fear or in some form of visioning the future, you know. So, so my basic uh, question to every realtor, every real estate person is, have you imagined the road back? Uh, as we get close to this uh, this idea of green, we're not there yet. We still have, you know, COVID-19 safety ratings and regulations with regard to visits. Uh, for you all in the residential business, there is certainly how many showings you're going to have, how many people can come in, how many people can come into the office, how many people are allowed in an elevator. All of those have to be sorted out and we're kind of still learning our way through that process. Um, another thing that uh, that came up uh, is the notion of air quality, which I, I'm, I'm being very generic and very specific right now. But uh, for those of us who do have offices and or work in office like yourself, you just got back in the office as well. We're just kind of getting back to things also. You know, what's the HVAC system? I mean, I'm being very specific and now, you know, very generic about it. But this is things that we think about every day in the administration of our offices, our shopping centers, when are we gonna open the malls again? Uh, very big question. 
we're just getting to, uh, you know, outdoor seating. How is that social dynamic going to work? Distancing and the like. Will our clients, our commercial clients, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, how are they going to face 2020 tax time next year? What's that going to really look like? Is it a decrease of 25%? Is it a decrease of 50%? And all of those dynamics are kind of mixing into this stew. But when we talk about, you know, that road back, uh, I'm going to just cite two sources. Uh, recently, the um, of all people, the executive chef of 11 Madison, Daniel Hume, who is a very notable uh, chef and restaurateur, three really high-end restaurants, 11 Madison in New York, was quoted as saying, now we have the blankest canvas you can imagine. So for those of us who are actively involved, whatever industry it may be, retail, office, industrial, residential, this is the opportunity to recreate your brand and at the same time, recreate your business if necessary. Um, <laughs> the other quote was from Laurie Garrett, who was the, uh, who is a fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health. And she said that um, COVID-19 catapulted us uh, into a reality that was inevitable. So if you put your thinking caps on and go back to this time last year, we were experiencing, although we had low interest rates and uh, low unemployment and the market was very aggressive, we still had underlying the economy uh, many factors that were fearful of uh, store closings and a variety of other elements like that. I don't want to take our time because we want to look forward today. But, you know, just to recap that history and keep it in its proper perspective, um, right now we still have uh, a number of professionals, real estate professionals, other corporate people who are, I call it crisis mode. Um, they've not necessarily come, they haven't followed the, you know, the yellow, red, green kind of mode. I mean, our companies are still being taxed and challenged. Um, we've been reacting, we've been pivoting, we've been operating more from fear than from a well-considered vision of the future. So, uh, you know, those are, if you will, the overarching, I've kind of filibustered a little bit here, but, you know, kind of the overarching thoughts that we all have. I mean, you all in the, uh, in the residential business have certainly endured the lion's share of it, but, you know, necessarily it's, uh, it, it is changing. And uh, there are a number of you um, and I wanted to give you a shout out right now. And if you don't mind, I wanted to acknowledge not only what you've been doing, your sister as well, because we have known each other since 2008 uh, through the first of the economic downturns, if you will. So we've been through this rodeo before, as have a number of you. But also you, some of you have, in fact, acknowledged the new new through social media and the like. And I'm just going to name a few names here who people that you know, like Damon Michaels, Gianna Gennetti, Kristen Daly, uh, Christy Berge, uh, Joanne Davido, Jason Kravitz, Ryan McManus, Mike Fabrizio, a couple other ladies, Nancy Allette, Isabella Greenberg, and our friend Heather Patron, who's done a remarkable job with keeping us in the forefront of um, the governor's office, uh, Dr. Levin's office making sure that you all in the real estate world, including the commercial world, are protected and at the same time keep our businesses you know, moving forward. So I commend all of you who have used social media and the like very aggressively. We know a lot about your families now. We know a lot about your kids. We know what you like to eat. We know what club, you know, what where you haven't been for dinner, but we're sort of looking for that. And then our friend Denise Barron, who is working very aggressively to implement those COVID cleanup uh, situations. All of you remarkable. And I, I know I've missed some people in the course of this. And there are there are people outside of our region who are obviously listening that won't recognize it. And I probably missed some people who deserve to be mentioned. But nevertheless, um, you've all done a remarkable job in acclimating and really adapting to um, some very, very arduous times. I mean, when, when you really think about it. So I guess my question for you to turn this table around a little bit, um, 
what would you recommend or what did you find from working remotely? And I'm going to qualify that question by saying that residential realtors, office brokers don't always work in the office. They have always kind of worked remotely. But now that you've been forced to shelter at home, what did you learn uh, from working remotely? Well, you must have lots of water beside your side if you're not going to move from your chair for seven hours. <laughs> Precisely. Precisely. No, I've actually, I actually enjoyed it. Um, I adapt it very quickly. And I am, as you know, a very social person. I also am a, a, a business owner who does go to her business every single day um, and starts the day with my staff. So we decided that we would do that every morning on Zoom. Uh, at 8 a.m., we have an 8 a.m. call, Zoom call, uh, where we all get together and just say what you know we got going on for the day. Basically, it's like what's on deck. Here's what we're doing. Here's our appointments, and I and then from there, many many Zoom listing appointments. So I actually really enjoy uh, Zoom. I think that it's efficient. Um, the brain actually. John doesn't know the difference between the TV and seeing somebody on the TV. We call this the TV exactly. than, than in person. So I have found that the connections that I have made with people that have been on my be the solution and or clients that we are working with has be, been a much deeper connection than eight than before, because now I'm not, you're not going to in the middle of this, pick up the phone, are you? Well, I wanted to the talk about the, the, the cell talk, phone, right? I you're wanted, not going to get up and you're not going to be walk. How if I would, I'm looking right at you. Correct. How, how about if I decided to look over here while we were talking? Well, we've all seen that happen too. So <laughs> you can't, you know, the kid you, walking, coming into the, uh, into oh, the well, that's, 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 that's just, that's part of it. But I'm saying yeah. is it's very, you're able to be very, very focused right. on the individual or a couple people. Usually it's a couple, you know, either a husband and a wife or two partners or, you know, a single for whatever on that person or people. And the connections that are formed, I have found are much greater. Did you, uh, also, I'm sure you observed the interesting thing about some of the other platforms, and there have become a number, there are about 11 or 12 platforms with which to have live meetings. But the beauty of Zoom was the limit of 40 to 45 minutes. So you became very efficient in your communication as well. It was almost as if it was, uh, you know, you're constantly aware of the clock. So you got right to the point, uh, you know, whereas sometimes live meetings, and we're all live meeting kinds of people. You're right. We're all very social that way. Um, let me ask you this next question. What did you find was the best way to manage your clients remotely, not just the buyers and the sellers, but the other, well, or, you know, just your clients in general, how are you managing them remotely as well? Well, we already did a lot of um, updating using email and <clears throat> things like that, but video, I send videos to people. So I, instead of just writing an email, I would say, hey, James, it was great seeing you uh, the other day to discuss Lombard Street. Thank you for your time. I look forward to discussing you know, the next steps with you, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is. Instead of just leaving a message or sending a text message, utilizing the power of video. One minute of video is stronger and more sustainable than 1.8 million words. Right. Way back in the night in early 92 with the inception of the internet, uh, one of my uh, former bosses at Jackson Cross, Charlie Seymour, made the remark that now we'll be able to do inspections, which obviously in the industrial world has been very prevalent remotely. Have you had any remote transactions whereby a video was used to show a buyer or a property and subsequently closed without the traditional site visit? 
Yeah, we've had several back in the month of um, April. You know, the first few weeks, we were in a state of shock, as probably most of the world, I think, were like most people. So our goal was to get every settlement that was on the books to the table. So the focus was, how do we work remotely as a company? And how do we get the clients that are under contract to the table? And then what is the next thing that we could do for our active seller clients? So, you know, fortunately enough for us, back in August, we started to do the 3D virtual tours. So we already own the camera. Um, we had most of our clients already had 3D virtual tours, but they started usually at a certain price range. And some of the other ones, like maybe they were commercial or they were a vacant shell. We didn't have those for those. So the, once they closed the restaurants, John, on March 16th, I said to my husband, I said, we need to get a virtual tour of every single oper every single active client or client that is in the pipeline and signed but not yet active right. before I think they're going to shut us down. I had a feeling we were going to be shut down, even though real estate was essential in all these other places. Um, I just had this gut in, in, uh, intuition. And so we went out and we had gotten all the three detours for every single property. So we were able to have people literally, we would get on Zoom with them, walk them through the three detour. Because I've been to these properties or one of my associates has been, we can talk more specifically about that particular property and show them, okay, well over here, you'll find, you know, there's a water closet or right. whatever it is. And, oh, I want to show you this ba the basement because this basement actually has actually been dug out. So you have seven and a half foot ceilings. It's not a six foot ceiling basement like you see in a regular Philadelphia row home. So all those little things, those are the attention to detail that we had to be able to facilitate uh, transactions right. while there were no actual real showings. Does, does this new mode of selling, it's not an entire substitution for good old fashioned face-to-face. -face. Obviously there are still right. those buyers and investors who need to kick the proverbial tires. That's never, I mean, they're just some investors that are, you know, they've got to be there, but there are some that are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, satisfied because this form of showing requires more due diligence on the part of the broker. In other words, to, 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 to produce this video, you have to be more attuned to any changes in the structure, any issues here. You have to elucidate more of those details to that. Um, it, it kind of leads to another question, and that is, what, what do we do? I mean, we're not out of this yet entirely. There's still a definition to be put forth in terms of how we're going to handle showings. But how do you, how do you really move deals forward um, in, in this current, you know, environment, if you will, how, how, how do you move those deals forward? Yeah. I mean, is it, it's not only is it different, but it's, it's much, it definitely is much harder. I mean, we're working two times, three times. I mean, every staff member we're putting in 11, 12 hour days every sure. day and some say half the days on Saturday and some on Sunday. I'm trying to get everybody have a, break on Sunday so we can relax our brains so we can operate come Monday. Um, but the, the, the timing of it is so much longer. So I'll give you an example, John, I would meet with the seller like on a zoom. And the first part of it is the intake process that happens in my office where Lisa actually is the person who, when a, an a, a seller or would call, she would put all the information. My back office would prepare everything that I need to analyze this property, which is several steps. There's about 20 different steps that happen before a, f a file even comes to me. I look at it, I analyze it. I speak with the seller. I have a conversation. It's not a scripted conversation. It's a case by case by case basis. What is there? And, and if they're buying and selling, and if they're buying and selling and moving out of state, there's so many nuances. There's so many different ways that we can go about the process of it. 
but navigating them through that in a very clear and concise manner that is extremely detail oriented to get them to where they want to go. So there is no one size fit all. Once I have that initial and I ask questions about the property, even though I have a lot of information, I ask more questions. Right. And I might say, do me a favor, zoom me around your house right, right. now. Just show me the kitchen, show me this. I need to see a couple things. It has then I can do the evaluation. I wish I do. I go offline again. I already had set another appointment. I send out the actual evaluation in writing in advance with other reports that give more detailed information for them. And then I have another Zoom. At that point, we're going to move forward and you're engaging my company. And then because now we're in yellow, to put the final, I say, you know, icing on the cake cherry on the top. Final is the staging consult in person. I will go out and meet with them. I will have a mask on, obviously sanitizing. Um, and I walk through the house with them and finalize what things that they will need to do to get the house prepped for sale. And it's a house. It's no longer their home. Their home is the next place that they go. This is a house, just like a car dealership is going to get the car ready for sale. They're not going to put a junky car without getting it inspected and changing the oil. We're going to do a couple things to make it staged ready. And then from there, we'll facilitate the process of what that looks like from an online marketing, online social media. Now that we're in yellow, I'm able to actually go back to the house. I'm going to be doing a uh, live open house this weekend at one of our properties with one other associate from my office who's going to help me. And then I'm going to be there and I can walk them through, show them, even though we do have the 3D tour, I can still do this. And then people can ask questions while I'm there. It so, certainly has uh, tested or fine tuned and sharpened our communication skills. As you say, uh, we've had to be very precise and concise uh, in terms of communications. There were a couple observations uh, that I had made early on. Uh, our very large tenant base, uh, you know, a number of those people, as I'm sure in your commercial properties, you found this as well, were very fearful of what was happening. They just did not understand what it was. But the beauty of shelter at home is that <clears throat> when I called your cell phone, I knew you were there. So there was no longer uh, initially in March and April, everybody was available. And you're right. We were all working from sometimes 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, depending upon where in the world you were calling, to very late at night, uh, you know, at 9 o'clock at night, making a 9 o'clock call to Shanghai, a 9 a.m. call to Shanghai, and vice versa, going in the other direction, as well as the United States. So, uh we were all working much more hours. I think we've learned how to run the marathon as opposed to the sprint, to use a sports metaphor. Um, but also it has required us to uh, also fine tune and sharpen our brand. And the reason I brought, you know, acknowledge you and Lisa and others in the community, because you have in fact uh, made your brand uh, beyond the traditional page in the Enquirer or whatever we used to do, uh, when was the last time you physically picked up a newspaper? I mean, we may never go back to that again, which is really part of the contraction which has occurred in our uh, in our world. And certainly as, as a result of the last hundred days, we've redefined a number of industries. But also uh, one of the suggestions that I have to a lot of brokers, realtors and the like, um, I find that we spend, we, I'm going to say that collectively, I find a lot of people repurposing media. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, I can read Forbes and Fortune and Barron's on my own. I, I really don't need you to tell me, you know, what CNBC said about the market today. What I want to know about is exactly, Maria, what you just defined. I want to know about Maria. I want to know about the property. I want to know about your thinking with regard to how you're going to be 
a better service to me as a, as a, you know, as a realtor, as a, you know, uh, in many respects on the resi side. And I have to isolate that for a second because on the commercial office side and the retail side, we're married for 10 years. I mean, we're together by virtue of that lease, which we all learned very, very clearly in terms of revisiting those documents in March and April, foreclosure, forbearance, you know, force majeure, all these various other terms, which our lawyer friends have, you know, insurance companies have now suddenly put in the forefront of their brain. But um, our job is to get blue ink on a piece of paper, even though we now have electronic signatures and notaries can be, uh, you know, the, the governor has approved uh, electronic notary. And I think we're going to get there with a variety of other things. Uh, it's a whole other argument as well. I think we all have recognized that there are not shortcuts, but uh, ways of more efficiently dealing with that. Um, and, and really anything that doesn't contribute to that close is a waste of time when you really think about it. Now, relationships aside, because in March and April, we were all calling every one of our clients as a courtesy, not an ingenuine statement, but how are you? You know, how's everything going? What are you doing? Uh, here's what we're doing, you know, sharing that information collectively to make sure that we were, uh, you know, not going sideways. And a lot of people did go sideways. Let's face it. Uh, there's a there's a recovery process that many of us, many, many of our colleagues will have to go through and it will be very tough. This consolidation, which we're seeing, um, the contraction, which we're seeing, uh, you know, might not bode well for for a lot. And we're hoping that, you know, this will get back up to normal. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, what advice would you give to yourself a hundred days ago? It's that's that questionnaire. What would you say to your younger self, or what? You, what would you say to yourself a hundred days ago? It's all going to be okay. Very, very optimistic. Very positive. Um, it's all going to be okay, and. And in some capacity, this too shall pass. So I think what I've seen, and John, you know, let me know what you think about this, is that when this first occurred, there was a state of shock. And either one of two things happened, or like several things. You hibernated and did nothing. You said you, did, you didn't believe it. You just didn't believe it. Right, there's a, the cheerleaders are saying, no, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. Or you said, well, let's take a wait and see approach. Or you took massive action. And the people in their industries that took massive action are the people that are gonna come out of this, out of the gate with new businesses, with new platforms for their business. There was, so there's so much opportunity to recreate what you've already created or start again, throw it out the window and make something up new. And I think I've seen some brands that and have done that and others. And, and I'll tell you, I'm a little bit shocked that some of the people in our real estate community who I've heard nothing from, not me personally, but social media is the way to reach a lot of people. It's not just how many people are on here watching us now. These videos get replayed thousands of times, right? So there's an opportunity to build your brand like never before. And if you think about this, it's one of the greatest opportunities from a business perspective as a business owner, whether you're own a brokerage or shopping centers, or you're a real estate agent, to, to reinvent yourself, to identify what your brand is, who is your avatar, what do you want from your life? Because life is short. And we only have, if, if not now, when? One of the unfortunate realities, and I, I promised I would not get maudlin in this, but we have all had to address. Um, I was supposed to have my 50th reunion from high school. Uh, mm. 
September. And of course that's been canceled. So we'll do it next year, but it's un very unfortunate how many of our friends um, and, you know, close associates we've lost, which is always the more regrettable side of this. So we do have yeah. to remember that that is true. We have, we have our, we've lost my great uncle in Italy from COVID-19. I didn't post about it online. Um, my closest pe friends and family know, I mean, obviously family know, but he was a, a, a much, a, a very older, older man. And, but he was very healthy in January when I saw him on January. In fact, he was, even though he's walking with a cane uh, partially, he was still running down the streets in Piacenza faster than my husband and I. And, uh, you know, I expected that we would see, have seen him this summer in August. And you bring up your 50th reunion. I have my 50th birthday coming up in August and there will be no big party that we plan right. to have right. in August on my birthday. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of, sad stuff right that that that's happened and that we all have to deal with and and it is you know we have to keep moving forward though i mean we just we have to as for our own sake and being right it speaks to uh another level going back to you know how we're going to get back into the office um one of the things that none of us in the industry want to experience is a repeat. And I, I'm, what I'm about to say is as much caution and warning as it is um, observation of uh, our economy as a commercial economy. Let's face it, our livelihood is contingent upon people buying and selling homes, renting office space, renting stores, going and shopping. We, you know, we have to get this economy reactivated. Um, even though yesterday uh, there was an announcement that uh, residential demand is up 11%, obviously people need to buy and sell homes. They do need to rent apartments. I'm, I'm overwhelmed at the demand for apartments recently. Um, on the other hand, I'm I'm going to digress for a second. I'm a little chagrin with the lenders. And we'll talk about banks before we leave this morning. But um, residential, industrial, give you money all day long. Retail and certain other commercials, you know, interest rates are at an all time low. Obviously, it it it's worth your while to buy a house right now, despite the fact that I think down payments are kind of you know getting pushed a little higher. I can understand risk management as we all can, um, and we'll certainly live and address those accordingly. Um, but it is imperative, imperative right now that we continue to enforce safety, health, wear that mask, if, you know, I mean, there's a variety of things. You know, look, I want the stores open, I want the bars open, I want the restaurants open, just as much as anybody else, whether it's, you know, for all of us, you know, our tenants who are going to face upwards of 50% less in revenues this year, social distancing, at least, at least uh, social distancing is going to force some of our restaurateurs and store keepers to see de minimis uh, or uh, increases in sales, if anything. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a uptick over mail, May sales, a 17%, uh, uh, you know, over the previous month. But that's nothing compared to where we should be. Look at all of our shore businesses, Asbury Park and the Wildwoods and the like, who are, you know, there's a constant debate going on with the mayors and the governor, uh, Delaware, New Jersey. We don't have shores in Pennsylvania, but we have other recreational activities. Yes, of course, we're lakes just, of the Poconos. And uh, we're just going through right now on Boathouse Row um, to personalize this discussion, getting people back on the water. We have kids who are supposed to go to Tokyo for the Olympics from Philadelphia who, uh, you know, everything's come to a virtual standstill. We recognize that. Oh, yes, we're going to go to Tokyo next year. But, you know, people are impatient, uh, sometimes reckless. In there, well, we've seen that. We've seen that, and I'm, you know, fingers crossed that we're not going to go through this, you know, rebound. We don't want that rebound, so we have to remind people to, to be careful. Um, 
you know, one of the interesting uh, you know, obstacles, if you will, is the face-to-face -face interchange that we're all used to doing. We are all, being in the real estate business is a social business, let's face it. We are, it's based on trust. It's based on, I like you, I don't like you. I'm gonna, I need the building, I, you know, whatever the, the issue may be, but we're all social people. We go to our, we, we're actively involved with our communities. We do a lot to promote philanthropy, to help people as much as we can. Um, you know, we are driven by commercialism. Let's face it. That's why we do what we do. Uh, it's sometimes a thankless job. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, we're going to get thanks. We, we appreciate the fact that somebody bought a home or rented a space or opened a store, <coughs> excuse me, but we all know that, uh, you know, that's doing business. That's what we do for a living. Yeah. But there, there's satisfaction though. And you have a family that wants to move to Orange County, California, or Myrtle Beach, or they're, you know, they're moving to Reading, or they're going to be, because they want to be closer to their families, a lot of this, or they want to be in a great retirement community. And the only way they can get there is working um, with somebody who's an expert at sure. being able to maneuver them through all the minutia, um, especially now with all the, you know, new structure in place. Uh, that as brokers we have to follow right. and it's always has to be safety first right so say safe say healthy you know john i'm very curious what is going on in the retail sector um i'm here i have a retail storefront uh you know right here at 21st and south and we're a retail store and but we don't sell re anything retail right so we, we we're, we're paying our rent um, but it's um, for three people right now. And for months, it was for zero people. And so I can't imagine that businesses can sustain that for a very long time. Um, what are you what are you seeing the future of retail and shopping centers and um, just commercial mixed use real estate? Um, what is your 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 expert opinion professional opinion on on all things retail let's um i know uh, i asked you a lot of things in that question well, but, well but this is this is something that keeps me wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning i'm not exaggerating i mean you know as well uh being a business owner uh in a industry that i mean we were we've all been just you know there I'm, I'm hesitating for a second because there's a worst case here. Uh, you have economists and very smart people, you know, right across the river at Wharton and right up the road here, right up Broad Street at Temple, who are studying this very aggressively, not only medically, but business-wise. And when you read their studies, uh, it, it, it's not a, 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 a good diagnosis. It's 24 months. Um, do we have a vaccine? I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a social theorist. I can only tell you, you know, we still have not opened our restaurants. Uh, well, you have outdoor seating. Uh, if you're a non-essential business, everybody in our industry knows what non-essential means. Daycare is open tomorrow, for example. Um, other businesses uh, will not open until the 22nd and they have to comply with COVID um, until we have a vaccine, worst case. Again, I'm not an epidemiologist, but this is well-documented information that an enclosed building will be extremely difficult. Now the Simon Company and the Taubman Company and uh, Preet and our friends at Preet and the like are, are very aggressively attempting to redefine sanitation, if you will, uh, washing of hands, cleaning of spaces. Imagine the expense related to that, you know, just in terms of supplies, masks and the life. Um, but yesterday, Zach told me that a mall in China, in Beijing was closed, reclosed because of an increase in infections. So we're going through this horrible cycle. Uh, again, I don't want to reiterate what we've already experienced, but the go forward is going to be a very steep slope. Um, yes, your office um, probably 
a number of other what we call um, retail storefronts, the Edward Joneses of the world, the accounting offices who do see uh, customers in a storefront environment um, have had to redefine the need to be in that office. Uh, that has a very significant impact on landlords and will continue to have an impact. Uh, how long can rent deferral last until such time as the retailer has accumulated a debt load? I mean, how much PPP, how much Main Street investment, how much rent deferral can the lenders and investors and the individual shopkeepers sustain? It's an it's a open-ended question. It's a big economic question. We know that already. Um, no, well, but if you, if you received PPP in April, your PPP money, most likely, if you continue to stay open, is gone as of now. Yeah. Well, mine's, yeah. mine's gone as of yesterday. Right. You, you were to pay your rent and then the two and a half uh, times, well, you were to pay your employees if you could. Which uh, we did. Should, and then you were to... Um, you know, pay your rent, any arrearage that accumulated and the like, a very steep slope going yeah. forward. I mean, the money's right now, we got it in April. It's today, it actually ended. Our eight weeks was up on the 16th, which was yesterday. I just looked at the it was 16th yesterday. Correct. So I got to imagine other people. And we filed the first day that you could file. So we were funded, you know, and improve with, with Republic Bank, which is an amazing, they were an amazing partner right. to work with. Um, was very fortunate to have relationships, right? Correct. At the bank, which, you know, it comes back down to the relationship. Absolutely. I was going to address that um, we're coming uh, on the end of our hour, but I think that's a good place to discuss communications and how we come out of this. And a very good friend of mine who in the 1990s, we worked for the FDIC and through a very similar bank failure period in 92 through 96, uh, she has come out of retirement and is now working uh, with some investors and lenders to, uh, to re redo their portfolios, if you will, very similar to what we did in the 90s and in 2008 through 2014. Her advice to me was, or suggestion was, when we come out of this, you have to come out arm in arm with your bank. And some of us, not all of us, but some of us, have been extremely communicative to the point of, don't call me, please don't call me today. You know, I, I love it when a banker says, but you just called me yesterday. Yeah, but I want you to know what's going on. I just want you to be aware. I'm sending you, a instead of a monthly report, I'm sending you a bi-monthly report. And really, they, look, in, in, in the most literal sense of the word, they do control the purse strings. Purse strings. Um, if you can get the Main Street loan and go through that documentation and paperwork, do it. If there's any form of relief, whatever it may be, attempt to get it. But work with your bank. Make sure your bank is a subscriber to those programs, but work with your lender. Do not, as you said earlier, some people went radio silent. Don't go radio silent. Now's the time to be that proverbial squeaky wheel. Like your mom always said, the squeaky wheel gets greased. You know, now's the time to do that. Share your thoughts, get their ideas because they're the ones, you know, FDIC said you were supposed to get six months of forbearance. Some banks are only offering three, but you know, okay, so I'll make an interest payment or I'll make a principal payment and, you know, we'll extend the loan or whatever the, it, it, yes, it's a case by case basis, whatever we need to do to do that. Um, Add to your cash position if you can. Now, I'm talking to business owners. Uh, I, I wish I had a solution for everyone who has been furloughed or laid off or whatever those circumstances are. But we're addressing right now realtors and other business people. If you can add to that cash position, however you can escrow it, try to do that. Do it as absolutely necessary. Yesterday, Peter Lineman, who we know from the University of Pennsylvania as a, a major investor, I mean, he's a frequent speaker to our industry groups, said that he put his portfolio in coma. And he is, you know, an interesting medical application because he said he's spending no more than is absolutely necessary until we get out of this. He's not being delinquent. 
It's not being you know remiss in any way, but just basically keeping the properties afloat. Um, so the questions that remain for landlords, what is a sustainable rent level? You all know what profit is and what we would like to make and what we think the property is worth. But there's got to be a level with which the retailer or the tenant can survive and you can you know, meet your obligations as well. So that cash flow analysis, we're all doing it. Let's face it. I don't think anybody who's listening to this is is immune to the realities of, you know, back of the envelope or Excel, whatever it is you're doing, you're doing it right now. But there is that, you know, that level that keeps everybody afloat. Um, the banks, you've got to be in relationship with your lender. Find out who's lending. Some people are not. Some people are. It's easy enough to find out. And then just remember that, um, you know, do not sell in a low market unless it's absolutely necessary. Now, I'm not speaking residentially now. I have to let's address our commercial friends right now. And we know many of them in the city. A lot of cranes right now. You know, we're still seeing a lot of cranes over the skyline, as in other cities, too. We know that the workers are out there working. Um, what is your what is your opinion, John, of uh, all these multi-million dollar condos coming to the market right now. I mean, they can't stop construction midway. So they have the loan, they have, they're building the buildings. Well, what are your, what are your thoughts about it? You're looking at 1200 plus a square foot minimum. We can, well, first of all, uh, I don't want to debate the abatement right now. That's a longer discussion. Maybe we'll do another. No show. abatement. No, no, no. Maybe we'll do it. Just of all the ones that are all the, the residential condos that will come to the market. Uh, Philadelphia is a very affordable city uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think breaking the $1,000 a square foot barrier was something that probably should have happened in 19103 and uh, other you know, zip codes a long time ago, but we, you know, I, I think we've come of our own. We're a world-class city. Uh, I think there are people who enjoy living here and can afford that. Um, I'm not an economist, so the demand and supply curve, I have my own theory about how that's going to be met. Uh, they'll come on the market. We survived 92. We survived 96. We survived uh, 2008, and uh, likewise, we will survive this. And uh, whether we have an abatement or not, Philadelphia is still a very affordable city. Uh, and also, I believe, as I've read, uh, you know, Mr. Dranoff, Southern Land, and a variety of others who are delivering PMCs, rentals, and the like, all notable. They're offering enormous, wonderful amenities. I'm not selling their properties right now, but the issue here is, uh, you know, service, and then the question, you know, who can afford twelve hundred dollars a square foot? Um, well, I think that the, the people are there. How many of them are there is another question, you know, because it's that's less than one percent of well, well, Maria, the, buy, the buyers in the market. But I think, yeah, well, go let's, ahead, go ahead, well, let's John. Just, let's just kind of quickly uh, look at that balancing act that takes place. Uh, you know, you're in the residential market, you know, family lives in the city, two kids, uh, whether they make a decision. I mean, we're talking lifestyle decisions right now, so I don't want to yeah. you know, delve into that. But a lot of those people want a backyard. And, you know, the, the, the boomer in Gladwin and Wayne, he doesn't want to cut the grass anymore. Doesn't want to, you know, uh, he doesn't want to mow the lawn, doesn't want to rake the leaves, doesn't want to shovel the snow. I mean, let me move to the condo. I'm retired. I did well. It, it doesn't take a lot of people to, to balance that equation. I'm generalizing. I realize that there are people listening right now who are saying, oh, you know, are you serious? Yes, I am serious because there is somebody who will move to Villanova or East Falls or Chestnut Hill or wherever, and that person will in turn substitute. We've seen uh, remarks made recently. We've, we've had over the past three months for a variety of reasons, a huge wealth transfer uh, to younger people. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I think we need another quarter, if you will, through September to analyze those metrics, see what happens. But, uh, you know, 
personally, like you, we live in the city. Uh, we want to see the city thrive. Uh, we will weather this storm. There will be a vaccine at some point. You know, we're getting good reports about that, and hopefully we'll get back to doing what we do, but not the same way we did it. There's obvious no. changes in the, in, the, in the horizon as well. I think what we, we're seeing boots on the ground is that, and this is obviously all very new, right? But there are some trends that I'm seeing. And then if you are ready, we're thinking of maybe moving out of the city. It was already in the brain. Correct. COVID and then protests, et cetera, has put people over the top that now might be a good time. However, there are people that live here right now. I'm also seeing people from New York who don't want to be in New York, but still want to be in a city Correct. that will come to Philadelphia now because they no longer have to go to their office space in New York. So I think the transfer of where people are coming from and where they are living will, they'll come down from bigger cities like New York or maybe DC come up from there possibly because they're very expensive cities to live in especially in New York City, were a fraction of the cost. They Correct. still want to be in a city, but they want to be in a more manageable city where you're not standing on people. You don't you don't run into people on a sidewalk here. I mean, a very busy day on Walnut Street, maybe you bump into one or two. And that nothing, nothing like New York City. Well so, you remember you remember a couple of years ago there was a inquiry. I think Inga Saffron or somebody mentioned that there were younger artists and musicians moving from New York to Northern Liberties and other neighborhoods and taking the bolt bus up to New York when they had to go to the city. I mean, let's face it. I, you know, I, we have a, we have a New York office. We have a Washington office and I live very close to 30. I can walk to 30th street beyond the train and uh, be in either of those cities in no time. It speaks to affordability. It speaks to quality of life. It speaks to education. Uh, we still are a very large neighborhood and a series of neighborhoods. Philosophically, we've we've grown up with that here in Philadelphia. I know that for a fact. Um, and there is a quality in Center City and in our neighborhoods as well. It, whether you know, even New Jersey, the, the New Jersey neighborhoods, the mainline neighborhoods, uh, even getting from Wilmington and the western suburbs uh, through public transportation. And we're we're finding, as a matter of fact, there was a study this morning that was saying that public transportation may not be as bad, not in terms of service, but in terms of transmissions. I mean, we can, you know, keep trains clean as well. So again, we're all learning that, but- Well, I think people will be more, um, uh, uh, probably more okay uh, with getting on a train than they will into an Uber. Yes, indeed. Have you been in an Uber? Uh, not since, um, candidly March 5th. Yeah. Not since I, I, I you know, I, I joke about it. People say, how are you doing? Uh, uh, Will Farrell, uh, there was a meme of Will Farrell who said, your email does not find me well. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was one. And the second one was, you know, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm in prison, uh, you know, for 109 days. Uh, we joke about that, but we joke about that to humor ourselves, to overcome, you know, and I don't want to end on a, on a down note because the idea is to provide constructive advice to our colleagues, to share ideas with them about, you know, what we are going to accomplish, what we're going to do. And the idea is, yeah, exactly, precisely, you know, just, you know, let's, you know, keep moving ahead, keep, keep rowing, keep, and my dad used to say, keep the boat moving, just keep the boat moving. So speaking of rowing, are you are you able to row? No, uh, we, as you know, I'm the treasurer of the uh, Friends of the Schuylkill Navy. Uh, I do know. And uh, we are dredging right now, which has been five years in the making. Um, a lot of people, Paul Horvat, Bonnie Muller, put their backs into that, got it done. Thank, uh, obviously, our mayor, Catherine Ott Lovell, and a variety of others who were instrumental. In accomplishing that, uh, we raised a lot of money. The Army Corps 
uh, our Congress, uh, our legislators were very helpful in that. So we're dredging Boathouse Row right now. But yesterday we just had our first COVID meeting. We've done a series of Bonnie Miller and the Schuylkill Navy done a series of meetings. We're getting the singles and the high performance teams out of Temple's Boathouse under Strawberry Mansion. And hopefully um, we will have a regatta next year. Uh, as you know, everything has, we're talking about the head of the Schuylkill in October. It'll be a kind of a, so nobody's been on the river since the shelter at home. But uh, the silver lining is that we've not had to compete with, uh, you know, rowing and, you know, the dredging operation, which was last time. Right, which would have been very difficult to do. Exactly right. Exactly. So a lot of That's kids. That's good. That's moving forward. That's exciting. Exactly. Exactly. So I you love and you all have seen, looked at, you know, Boathouse Row, we light it every yes. night for a variety of things as the, you know, in conjunction with the rest of the building. So it's a beautiful city. That's for sure. Well, I'm born, bred Philadelphia in my whole life. So I have a great love and passion for this city and the people in it and the businesses in it. And we want to see them thrive. I, I had heard something I thought was really interesting the other day, and I'm actually going to reach out to them. A pumpkin on South Street, a little restaurant who maybe did 50 covers, maybe a night. Um, you would think maybe somebody like them, wow, how are they going to survive, right? Because it's, if, I don't know if you've ever been in there, but it, it is tiny. I, I mean, it can't be more than 800 square feet, the, the seating, and it's tight. So I had heard that, you know, since then they have been uh, doing takeout and doing over a hundred dinners a night. Exactly. So I, it's really great and inspiring to see how many businesses have actually uh, grown through this. And, you know, there's, there's, they've changed, right? They changed the way they're doing things. And there's some restaurants that are offering like a cook and solo group that every night they have a different uh, menu that you can get something from, uh, the, the, the Marrakesh and dising off and, you know, and they're marrying them together and they're cooking it in their main kitchen, but you go to that place to pick it up and, you know, the, uh, the union league, I don't know, we've gotten some great takeout from there. So yeah. going to, we've, um, they did a great job at some of our other little favorite spots. We've gotten some food from, uh, Fiorella's pasta bar. You can order from them, Village Aroma. Uh, Skinichios, uh, Zorba's. We've been, we've been, you know, I actually, and, and I don't know if I, I don't think I've told you this, but I quarantined myself for, I want to say it, maybe it was nine weeks where I didn't, I only went out, in the, out three times and it was in the car only uh, because I have some um, autoimmune issues myself and, you know, so I literally, I mean, you talk about, and I joke too about it, like, oh, I'm in my, I'm in my little prison over here in my house at 21st and Catherine, and it, you, it became like such a routine: work, 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 stop work, put on music, cook dinner, have a glass of wine, make this great dinner, go work. back upstairs, do <laughs> more work. Exactly. Now, after two glasses of wine, no talking to people though. Then that's one of the uh, one of the kind of evolutions. Uh, and recently, I've enjoyed the seven o'clock senior hour at uh, Whole Foods on Callow Hill. But um, I we experimented with a number of restaurants who opened what were called pantries. I ordered groceries from Del Frisco's Grill. Um, steaks, asparagus, things of that sort. Uh, and I, we were more intrigued with how the Paneras and the Ruby Tuesdays were reinventing themselves to sustain their businesses. So a number of, you know, very adept, forward thinking restaurant person and the like, uh, the flip side of it, some didn't do takeout so well. Uh, not that the food was bad, they just couldn't afford to do it. Um, others, the smaller restaurants did very well. They, uh, you know, and I think it's still important to support our small businesses 
and to do what we can to you know help them out as well. Uh, we did delivery for a while, but I enjoy uh, mask and gloves in the in the market. Uh, so we'll see how that works we out. We did we did a lot of cooking. I I cooked for eight weeks straight, <laughs> nine weeks straight, no nine weeks straight every single meal. I was, which I don't mind, but. I was tired of actually loading and unloading the dishwasher, believe it or not. That got to be. I've become an expert at that. I'm an engineer when it comes to dishwasher. Yeah, that's my husband. He <laughs> loves the dishwasher. He said, I'm a terrible dishwasher loader and not even to touch it because right. you know why? I don't like puzzles. <laughs> that's one if, way to work at it, you know. If you like puzzles, you're good at loading the dishwasher, right? right. So, John, will have you been out to frequent any outside dining? I have not yet. Um, I am still being cautious. We walk every day. We take a very, very long walk. Uh, just explore parts of the city, you know, where we're located allows us to do that. West Philly out into Penn's campus or north, um, you know, and the like. Uh, over the weekend observed uh, a lot of restaurants with outdoor dining. I wasn't real happy with what I saw in some cases. Uh, mm. I think not the restaurant, but the participants uh, failed the test. Um, but uh, I think a lot of restaurants have recognized the fact that outdoor seating, uh, look, there's a lot of sidewalk that's underutilized. So, uh, you know, once uh, L and I and, uh, PLCB recognizes that it can be done. Uh, you know, ordinarily, prior to this, you could not take a drink that far from a restaurant, as an example. Um, but now, uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that that restaurant can survive, others have been doing outdoor seating for a long time. So it's the indoor that's really the, the, the diminish of their revenues. I mean, people want to get out, they're desperate to get out. And this is where, um, again, not to be a, a, a naysayer, but you know, pe our, our customers enjoy being out, going to restaurants, going shopping, doing things that were social people, were commercial people. And in that anxiety to be re-engaged, I think some folks get sloppy and I'm always fearful of, again, not to be that pessimist, just to be that cautious optimist that we might slip. Don't want to slip back. Just do not mm. want to slip back. We, so We went to park Friday night and we invited another uh, couple to join us. It was actually my friend's, uh, my husband's friend's birthday, coincidentally. And we had a lovely time. They did a great job. Carol Serena over there is a remarkable right. woman. Um, you probably know Carol, John. She's she's fabulous. And you know, they ran they run a tight ship over there. So sure. they had about sixty-two, not tables, but they were able to accommodate sixty-two diners. Right. Uh, along the which they've already done, right? They, it was at park. They already had the outdoor seating. So but they had a limited menu. Um, still, what we had, I had the trout. My husband had the steak. It was trout MD. It was very good. Our server, it was really good to see. You know, it's his first day back working and that, however many. Were you restricted with the amount of time you could stay? Well, we had a nine o'clock reservation. So we were the last reservation. Um, I think we. Let's see, we, we were out for three hours. We left our house at 8.30. We walked over. We could have walked over with a little cocktail, but we did not. We had one at home first. Um, but I thought that was lovely. I mean, listen, they've been doing takeout over there and selling frosés for $15. I don't care how many $15 frosés you could sell. It's probably not what the number one uh, producing restaurant revenue-wise in Philadelphia will ever make up. You know, they were... Correct. All right. A powerhouse of a restaurant, but they do a remarkable job. We um, we probably left there at about 11, 15. Um, and it was a nice night out. I was excited. We saw some other people that we know, uh, a couple other people, another uh, friend, Mark Nicoletti. He was getting takeout to go sit in the park with his, uh, his family. And then I saw another few people, some uh, clients. We are investors of ours that we do business with. So 
it was nice to actually feel a tiny, tiny bit of normalcy exactly. and be able to support, you know, the restaurant community as they slowly open up. And, you know, we, I think in here in Philadelphia, we've been, we are a slower place to open. Look, we were in, in real estate, 60 days closed, non-essential. Correct. The only place in North America that was closed for 60 days, Michigan uh, opened a few weeks before we did, but outside of us, uh, those two states, everybody else was deemed essential for most of the time. Although I don't believe they're able to show any property in New York City still. It's, it, it is still, you know, a lot of definition with regard to those COVID uh, regulations. Uh, uh, Resi, very difficult. Look, the transition that we're experiencing with apartments, for example, uh, you know, as graduate students are moving out, medical students are now starting to get placed. Those apartments are coming on the market. Um, by the way, uh, a lot of people who are in the apartment now do not want visitors coming in, um, you know, just quickly looking at an apartment until such time as they've moved out uh, for fear of, even though there are COVID waivers and a wide variety of things we're doing to take care of it, there is still that intrinsic fear that, um, you know, something may happen. Um, and caution. I uh, can't throw caution to the wind right now, especially, but, uh, you know, no, you can't, but I think that, you know, they're, they're with taking all those cautions, we can do it in a safe way. Correct. And also what I found is that the, you're only buying, selling or renting an apartment right now. If you're serious. Correct. Yes. If you're not, if you're not serious, the tire kickers or right. the lucky lose, are right. a day of the past. Right. So it's, it's, if you if you're not going to follow these guidelines, okay, no problem. Oh, you don't want to get pre-approved? Okay, right. that's right. fine. But I don't know who, what what broker or agent would be working with a non-pre-approved person in this environment. I I don't think anyone really wants to test that. Um, look, we're all anxious as we talked about pretty thoroughly the theme of this discussion is, you know, let's get, you know, let's move forward, but you're absolutely correct. I don't think anyone wants to challenge, uh, you know, any of those provisions. Uh, yeah. We've had people call us and say they didn't want to get approved. And we said, fine, that's, that's not a problem. We're right. not going to be part of that. We as being the solution won't be part of that solution. Correct. Exactly. Right. right. Because exactly. we have to protect our sellers. We have to protect, yes, sure. right, and sure. ourselves. And so I think you'll see, you know, I think we're going to start to come alive as we get into the green. Um, I don't know, though, John, do you know what, when we go back to pass the green? It doesn't. Uh, I have tracked it, I believe, as well as the information that comes out of Dr. Levine's office and the mayor's office. Uh, I, you know, what does, you know, when you get the green, the COVID-19 protocols don't go away. No. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> you know, when we talk about we're in the green now, does it mean we can take the mask off and not wear gloves and not sanitize a building or, a, or an elevator. I, I think, you know, your, your question to me was, you know, when uh, earlier on we were talking about the economic impacts of this, I don't think this goes away until the vast majority of people have been vaccinated or there's some form. Again, I, I, I try to follow this aspect of, of it as well. I mean, we all do. We're we're very highly literate. We're anxious and hungry for that information that's going to, you know, give us, you know, that go ahead. But, you know, I, I, I think it's very clear cut and one has to be very, very precise about it. Um, this the, until such time as everybody has been vaccinated, until such time as we have um, assurance that it is, I think we're going to be living with masks for a while. I think we're going to be living with a lot of sanitizer um, until such time as this gets under control. Uh, don't mean to 
come to the conclusion on a, a low note, but you know, let's be cautious optimists at the same time, which I think is the we're, best. We're prepared over here. Exactly. We we went out and bought four gallons of sanitizer. So when you walk in my office and it's on the wall, it yeah. says, please sanitize and I put a mask on. I and that's everything's is right there. But we're not letting people in unless they're coming in to right. sign a D package or something like that. I thought one of the best jokes was I've washed my hands so many times. Uh, the answers to my Latin uh, class and Sister Anita's class came out. <laughs> <In the ink. laughs> I washed my hands so many times. The answers to ninth grade Latin came out. So. That's funny. Very I remember those days. Very much so. I remember those days. So in concluding our time today, John, what what do you want to tell the audience that they can do, whether it's the brokers or a business person, like how how if somebody's feeling like a little stuck right now, how what can they do to move themselves and their their business forward? You know, um we have all experienced uh there's a great word, it's called torpor. And that means that we've all experienced that down, slow lag in our lives. Uh, we're tired of being inside. We're tired of wondering where the money's coming from. But when you really think about it, we've always dealt with that. We've always dealt with that in our careers. Yes. The problem right now is that what's defining us, we don't understand. In 2008 and 92, we knew that it was economically driven and that it would recover, albeit 14 months or three months. So you're not an epidemiologist. You're not gonna solve that problem. So take a step back. You already know the answers to your business. You may have to significantly redefine the way you do business or get in we talked about communications. We talked about reaching out. I was making 60 to 100 calls a day in March and April. Not so much to be gratuitous and ask people how they were doing, but really to stay connected to them in lieu of let's go to lunch or let me come to your store or whatever. Right. And you're still we're still going to have to continue doing that. So, yeah. you know, dust, dust yourself off. You know, like your dad or granddad would tell you, however, whomever was your mentor in life, dust yourself off. And we have to get up every morning. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to make this sound like a, a, a silly song or, you know, some kind of, yeah, everything's fine. Everything is not fine. You know, but you're going to solve this problem. Uh, there are people who are working on a vaccine right now. And, you know, we have great medical institutions in the city. So I'm presuming them or someone else in the world is going to do it. But my advice to everyone is keep the boat moving. Do not stop. And by the way, don't look back. There's no reason to look back. We've already been through it. We've been through one of the worst quarters we'll ever experience. Now we've got to get through this summer. And for those of us uh, I may not be opening stores, but you're going to sell houses, you're going to rent apartments, and um, the idea is, is to keep doing that. Um, I think the one thing that it's forced all of us to do is to look at the balance sheet very carefully and redefine what we really need to survive. That's the other thing, too. It's been a real reality check. Um, it's challenged every aspect of our lives, whether it's going to church whether it's socializing, going to a restaurant, whatever, it's challenged everything. So um, optimism, cautious optimism, perhaps is the mainstay for all of this. I, you know, goodness, somebody's listening to this saying, yeah, you, it's easy for you to say, of course, all, someone always has it worse, someone always has it better, but our job, because we have individualized businesses, basically, as we know, real estate is a Yes, I am licensed with Maria Quattrone. I'm saying this hypothetically. I'm licensed with a broker of record. I'm doing certain things. But in fact, the bottom line is I'm in business for myself. This is the greatest example of entrepreneurship that exists. There is a downside to this. And that is, as in 2008, probably upwards of 40% of our colleagues will not 
be back with us next year. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, it will redefine, redefine our industries. And um, it's, 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 it's probably part of a process that a number of people will have to go through. They'll really have to analyze uh, kind of the reality of, is this the right business for you? Uh, and I do not mean to end on a dour or down note, but uh, the truth is always imperative under circumstances like this. And, yeah, um, it is. And, and it's okay because some people may have been in getting ready to retire correct. or maybe they were thinking about doing another business. Maybe they correct. wanted to be in mortgages or they want to be in a more creative and on the staging side and, and, or maybe they want to be a, a, a flipper, a rehabber correct. and not a real estate agent. And it's okay because the last time a lot left and more came in. That's true too. There. And so it's a cycle of life, right? It's a there cycle a of a business. Yes. And we will, and you know, more won't come in right away, but down the line, there will be more people that will enter the business again. And, and it will continue to ebb and flow of like, course. like life does. And, you know, it gives us an uh, opportunity uh, to continue to sharpen our skills and to increase our awareness about, you know, really what's happening in our industry. And if you haven't already done that, you know, now's the time, you know, to sit down and say, what can I do? And how do I become the market expert? How do I become this in this niche or whatever it is, you know, that you want? And that's not just real estate. That's in, in, in every industry, whether you're a restaurateur or, you know, you're baking donuts and it, it's all the same. It's all right. cyclical. And, you know, our job is to continue in our life to help others uh, and ourselves to be the solution right. and to face the challenges and to come out of it, you know, in a way that it helps to shine light on others. So we'll do it. For sure. Well, I appreciate you and I appreciate our time together today. My We've pleasure. talked for a while and, and we it went actually really fast, I thought. <laughs> um, but well, we're both talkers, so you know. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. So I appreciate you, John. And uh, please set, tell Alexis to send hello and we will see you soon. Thank and you. I, I look forward to seeing you in person and yeah. I will. Hold you to that party that you're having. Yes, indeed. Oh, the same day, the St. Patrick's, everything that we missed, you know, for sure. Yeah, the derby, the whole thing. Exactly right. Exactly. All right. Well, you, you take again. take care. I will see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.